And then I have to find where I hit where to broadcast. And I'm not finding it. So uh, it is recording. It is recording. So let's get started. And my technical folks can text me with instructions. OK. Well, I'll just say welcome to everybody and hand the baton to Barbara to walk us through the agenda. And I want to have a lot of time for discussion with you all about what we're going to do to help out with the outreach. So Barbara. So why don't we do our roll call if the secretary could call the roll. Certainly, Member Decino. Here. Member Haydu. She's coming. Here. Here. <laughs> Member Kraus. Member Shade. Here. Member Sweedler. Present. Here. Vice Chair Mosher. Here. And Chair Warden. I'm here too. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, Chair Warden, it would be appropriate for a flag salute and... All right. Susan, if you could cue up our flag. We have a flag? Ooh, yeah. We do. All right, while she's doing that, let's uh, go ahead and I'll just start us off and then it's all over the place when we all try to talk at the same time. So mute or do whatever you like. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. I might have gotten some of that out of order, but hey, so what? All right, back to you, Barbara. Okay, so this is our uh, special meeting that the board did uh, authorize us to have uh, in order to uh, prepare for uh, customer outreach in support of the May 2021 launch. And uh, because our, our uh, official, I guess, notification to customers will begin in mid-March, uh, we, uh, Chair Warden went to the board and asked, you know, uh, gave the pitch that a, a February meeting would be most appropriate of the committee to uh, see, uh, learn more about Clean Energy Alliance and um, talk about customer outreach. We have some specific uh, information to share in the in the presentation and then talk about and kind of get your ideas and thoughts on kind of key stakeholders and outreach uh, we might consider as part of our launch to help us minimize the opt-outs and make sure folks are appropriately informed about uh, CEA that they have the right information so they can make the right choice for them uh, with regards to staying in or opting out. I do have our communications team. Uh, CEA has engaged uh, Trapepe, the firm Trapepe Smith to provide our marketing and communications uh, support. They are the team that helped us with our brand, our logo, the update of our website, and are also now transitioning into our outreach efforts and customer noticing. So I'm gonna bring up the, um, the presentation and they will be key in um, uh, walking us through there. Well, hold on one moment. I've got to get to the right place here. Okay. And I'm not gonna lie, I have had some interesting things going on with my technology here this week. So there you go. I can, can see it. Okay. And then let me know, let me know if the slides are advancing. Yes, they are. Well, okay. So I am going to turn it over to um, Catherine Griffith, Griffiths and Karen Villasenor. They are our um, team that is helping us with our outreach. Welcome and thank you for coming, you guys. Thank you, Barb. So as Barb said, I'm Karen Villasenor. I am with Trapepe Smith. And we also have my colleague here, Catherine Griffiths, um, to join us as well. 
All right, so let's get started. As Barb mentioned, our goal here is to help you understand CEA and help you prepare, help prepare you to teach uh, your community all about CEA and what, what it is. So to start, we wanna provide an, inter, um, an overview of how CEA works. Um, essentially, CEA is going to be buying electricity directly from energy suppliers, but CEA is still going to be partnering with SDG&E so that they continue delivering that electricity to homes and businesses. Um, so that's the only change. The only change is that CEA is going to now buy that electricity. Um, everything else remains the same. SDG&E SDG &E is going to handle billing. They're still going to maintain power lines and they're still going to get that electricity from the energy sources over to um, the homes and businesses of the communities. So by purchasing electricity directly from energy suppliers, CEA is going to have a greater control over the renewable energy content of the electricity that goes into your community. All right, and we also have a brief overview as well um, some more t details about what Clean Energy Alliance is. Um, so Clean Energy Alliance was formed by the cities of Carlsbad, Del Mar, and Solana Beach, and is going to be launching May 1st, 2021. Um, CEA is supported by ratepayers, not taxpayers, and as a joint powers authority, it is a separate legal entity from the member agency cities and the budget of CEA is also entirely se separate from the city's general funds. Um, as we know, Solana Beach does have a clean, um, a community choice energy program right now. And when CEA launches, Solana Beach's program is actually going to be merging with CEA. Um, CEA is going to be offering residents and local businesses clean power at competitive rates. So these are the main reasons that the cities chose to start a, um, a cl clean choice energy program. Um, it was mainly to meet the, the goals of each municipality's climate action plan. So these plans for each city outline the goals, their goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, some steps outlined in these plans include adding more energy efficient infrastructure like solar panels and EV charging stations. Um, each of these cities put a lot of research into um, CCE and what it would mean for the community and decided that it was the next be best step to meet the goals of their, um, of their climate action plans. So that's one of the main reasons, as well as the ability to reinvest um, revenue generated by the program back into the community. So CEA is a locally controlled not-for-profit entity. So any extra revenue is going to be reinvested into the community through energy projects and programs. And these are some of the main benefits of CEA. Um, so by joining together, the cities of Carlsbad, Del Mar, and Solana Beach are able to pull their community's energy demands and therefore increase their purchasing power for higher renewable energy content. Um, this is going to really help the cities advance quicker on their mission to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, um, revenue, available revenue is going to fund energy projects and programs like, like clean power facilities, rebates, and other incentives. <clears throat> and the last point here is that CEA may choose to create clean power facilities like solar and wind power farms to generate electricity for the community and has the potential to create new and local jobs. And here we outline what options customers are going to have when CEA launches. So there are going to be three product offerings. As of now, there's going to be three main ones. Your green impact, which is 
a 50% renewable energy content offering, your Clean Impact, which is a 100% renewable content offering, and a Personal Impact, which is going to be available for customers who do generate their own power through um, solar panels. Um, I will note that the CEA board is also considering a 50% and 75% carbon-free product, as well as a program that is going to offer rate relief for small businesses and low-income customers. Yeah, and uh, if I could just add here, um, all customers when they're enrolled are automatically enrolled in the uh, green impact product, which is the 50% renewable energy. Um, the 100% renewable energy is a uh, product that's available for customers to uh, voluntarily opt up to. Um, it is also available if a uh, if a, one of the cities chooses, uh, they could elect to have their customers uh, all uh, be enrolled in the 100% renewable energy, but that product does carry with it the additional premium cost uh, for that additional um, a, a premium rate uh, to cover the additional cost of buying that additional 50% of renewable energy. Um, and so the, the individual cities uh, would make that determination. If they make no, if they take no other action, all customers are enrolled in the uh, green impact, which is a minimum 50% renewable. The, the JPA agreement does set a goal of achieving 100% renewable for all customers by 2030. And so every year, that 50% is gonna grow a little bit uh, heading, towards, heading towards that goal line. So, you know, it, it's gonna be, it, it's at least 50% renewable. Thank you, Barb. Oh, and we just spoke about those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So Barb pretty much just covered this. Customers are going to be automatically enrolled in the default product offering of at least 50% renewable energy content, and they may choose to opt up to 100% renewable energy um, or opt out and return to SDG&E. Um, and I'll note that all program options are currently being finalized. Okay, and we're not gonna jump into a discussion about um, CEA customer outreach. So right now, what we have planned out is our four different notification mailers about CEA's launch. They will be going out um, for May enrollment. They're going to be going out in March, April, and then um, two mailers will go out after the launch in June and July. So these, um, Barb, actually, do you want to jump in and talk about the June enrollment mailers really quick? Sure. Okay. Uh, at the request of SDG&E, uh, we've split our customers into uh, two separate months for enrollment. 90% uh, of our customers are enrolling in May. Uh, all of the residential are enrolling in May and all of Solana Beach is enrolling in May. Uh, the remaining customers, which are generally larger businesses with more complicated billing arrangements, will be enrolling in June. Um, so we're, we're really enrolling over the course of two months. And um, the, the notification process, the mailers are a require, is a required step um, that's required as part of the enabling legislation. And uh, the mailers our, our notification, and we're going to show you a sample, but they notify the customers that they, they are within the territory and will be enrolled, and also provides them information on uh, with regards to their uh, ability to opt out should they, choose, uh, should they choose and not want to continue to be enrolled into, um, into, into the uh, C CEA. Uh, the mailers are you know, a starting point, I, I would say, for customer outreach. Uh, there are some CCAs that don't, uh, don't do significantly more than that, um, but um, there is, uh, we do want to make sure that the message is out there and that, um, you know, we've spoken to the right groups and also that we address misinformation, which in this, in this current age of social media, 
It's easy for uh, customers for there to have bad information or, or misinformation get out there and spread quickly and potentially drive opt-outs because of, of, of that. So we wanna make sure that we've, um, we can put that out quickly and that we've um, spoken to the right groups in terms of making sure that they, they're they aware of the program and uh, are comfortable that they, they understand it. But they may still decide to opt out. And of course, that's the, the choice part of community choice aggregation. The customers can, can opt out, um, but we hope that um, you know, they'll understand the, the goals of the program and that it's consistent with the city's climate action plan goals and addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And it was in all of the climate action plans, if it's not the top, uh, wasn't the top uh, pr uh, way of hitting goals, uh, it was very close to the number one initiative wow. to put into place. Thank you, Barb. Um, Barbara, so, can yeah. I ask a question before we go on to the mailer and, and the details? Um, <laughs> I'm concerned that we've got some mixed messaging already when we start talking about the uh, low income program with 36% um, uh, clean content. Um, that's lower than SDG&E. Uh, my understanding is that the CARES program for low income customers is funded on the transmission side, not on the generation side. So. Uh, that should still be available to customers who are currently enrolled in the CARES program through SDG&E. Uh, and it's also contrary to the, the Climate Action Plan in, in each city. So uh, even putting that out there as a possibility seems to me to undercut some of the uh, messaging about meeting our Climate Action Plan goals. So could you comment on that issue? Uh, absolutely. Uh that um, program, the board has not uh, officially approved yet. There's, it's something they're considering and still um, have before them. Uh, the, the, I think that the reason it's uh, being considered is, you know, the current economic times are not what they were, you know, a, a, even a year ago with the impacts of, um, of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, and, um, you know, that we're in a, in a rate environment where uh, you know it's going to be challenging for us, and we'll get into this a little bit later. But it will be challenging to uh, our best case is that we will launch with rates that are that result in customers paying the same as they would with SDG&E. Uh, it's possible that we will actually be a bit higher, and the board wants to be sensitive to that and not uh, discourage customers uh, from participating. Uh, the board has provided direction that uh, a program be brought back for their consideration that would be limited in term to potentially one year. Um, and that after that year that that program or that additional credit would go away. Um, you are correct that uh, customers who qualify who are low income that qualify for the uh, CARE program, which is, uh, stands for California Alternative Rates for Energy, uh, is a credit or a, a lower rate that it does appear on their uh, transmission and delivery side of the bill. They receive the same amount of credit, whether they're a CCA customer or they stay as an SDG&E customer. So this would be uh, something that would be in addition to that. Um, but the board has expressed um, that, you know, they understand that, you know, it, it would be limited in scope to who it would be available to and uh, would be a limited term. Uh, and it's, uh, the interest is uh, really driven by uh, not wanting customers to opt out because in the event that, you know, our rates uh, may be uh, a bit higher if that, if that happens, if that comes to pass. And, if we are at or below, this would give um, an additional little boost um, to those customers. Well, one follow-up question. My understanding from the Department of Energy's latest numbers is that the cost of solar and wind is less than the cost of natural gas. So if you go down to 36% clean, 
uh, is that a, a cheaper source of energy or are we just subsidizing uh, these people out of uh, other funds? It's not a, it's not a subsidy because it's the, if we're procuring that there is an added cost uh, over and above buying conventional energy, there is an added cost to then green up and buy the renewable energy. That energy is not cheaper than conventional market rate energy. So to go from the state required minimum, which is 39% up to 50%, is an it will be and is an additional cost to Clean Energy Alliance. If they were, if they were not, uh, didn't have that goal or set that minimum of fifty percent, their overall energy costs would be lower, and so the amount of credit will be equal to the per kilowatt hour uh, uh, differential between the state renewable energy and that increase up to 50%, whatever that incremental per kilowatt hour rate is, would translate into a credit, a, a penny for penny or you know, tenths of pennies per kilowatt hour, however it turns out to be. So Thanks, Barbara, let me make a comment at this, at this point just about logistics. I'm not sure what people's time availability is today, but our mission for today, we want to divide into subcommittees if people think that's a good idea and be able to bring back reports. We're gonna have another meeting in March and the, what the CEA board did was rather than create an extra meeting, they uh, moved up our June meeting. So on the, I think the reasonable theory that right now is when we can help Terpepe board the most in, con, in uh, establishing this outreach program and carrying it out. So. And that once it's launched, there, there will be stuff to do for us after that. But right now, that's kind of our mission as I get it. And really, I think what we want to try to achieve today is have a good understanding what Tripepi Smith is going to do and got planned and how can we facilitate and help that? And what can each of us do in our home city between now and March uh, to help with that? So with that, Barbara, I'll hand the baton back to you. Okay. Uh, so this is the, uh, the mailer as currently drafted that would uh, be going out. The first mailer is going out in March. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the front side, which uh, explains, uses the same graphic that we just saw um, in our presentation of kind of how does community uh, choice energy work. Uh, it outlines, it describes um, who Clean Energy Alliance is, that uh, beginning in May, that we would become the default energy provider for the cities of Carlsbad, Del Mar, and Solana Beach, um, and then describes uh, how it works and the benefits. So again, this is uh, very similar to what we just went through in our presentation in terms of how it works and the benefits. Um, once we have, we're in the process of acquiring our, a, a toll-free number once we have that, the toll free number will be on here. So it provides customers with uh, it, where to go to get more information and you know how to opt up or opt out. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the mail side is what I guess I would consider the, the fine print, the terms and conditions. Uh, these terms and conditions is language that is uh, approved by the PUC. So we, we don't have much latitude uh, in, in changing it. In fact, we have zero latitude in changing it, um, but it provides uh, information on the enrollment, uh, uh, the time period that customers have in which to make their election to opt out should they choose, uh, what happens after the 60 days should they not opt out that they're subject to SDG&E's uh, terms and conditions with, and rules with regards to opting out. Uh, it, it explains that the customer still just receives one bill and we're gonna go through that bill here today. Um, what happens if they fail to pay? It touches on um, the care program that we just talked about and that there's no impact to their discount by enrolling and where to find additional information. Uh, so this will be the, the first mailer that goes out. Uh, we will have uh, three additional mailings 
uh, they will have the same information, but we put it in a different format each time in, in the hopes of attracting attention. So if customers get this mailer and it looks like something that looks like junk mail and they toss it, uh, we're going to send a letter and hopefully that letter maybe gets their attention. Uh, the third mailer is going to be more of a, a, a the, the, the set, I'm sorry, the second mailer and fourth mailer will be a smaller uh, black and white postcard. So again, the idea is different formats attract attend, people get attracted by different formats and trying to uh, increase the possibility that at least one will catch their eye and that they'll be made aware. Question, where, where is uh, the net metering issue discussed? I know there's a lot of people in all three of our cities with home solar and that's really uh, question can, number one for them. Can you hold on uh, just a moment? We actually have, looks like we have someone joining, a, a visitor joining us. Okay, sure. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Warden. Um, you were asking about the net energy metering? Well, I, a lot of the home solar users in all three of our cities, that's question number one in their mind. And I don't see that information and in just skimming this first mailer. So this mailer, and you'll notice we don't talk about uh, specifically about a green impact or clean impact. We, we refer people to our website. There's just not enough space on one mailer. Um, customers with net energy meeting, metering actually get an additional communication that specifically talks about the impact of the enrollment in Clean Energy Alliance. Um, we are talking to sdg and &E about what the best path forward is for enrolling net energy metering customers. As you know, um, net energy metering customers, their credits and charges are tracked over a 12 month period. Uh, those 12 months are not the same for every customer. And if, cust if those customers are all enrolled in May, that may result in um, customers whose 12 months don't end in May, nice and clean, would be trued up midway, midway through. Uh, that results in winners or losers. Uh, it could result in a customer having uh, you know, accrued charges without the benefit of the generation, future generation of their system. And so we're, we're talking with SDG um, and uh, and about uh, whether or not they're agreeable to looking at phasing in the net energy metering to coincide with the end of their 12 months. So we don't have that negative impact of a mid course true up uh, in the middle of that 12 month um, period. So those, those discussions are still ongoing and we should have um, a definitive answer from them within the next few weeks. Thank you, okay. Could I just say that that's a really important issue uh, in Del Mar, if, if we had to true up in May rather than uh, October, our normal rollover date, that would cost us about $1,500. Yeah, uh, and, and we recognize that, which is why we're really pushing uh, with sdg and &E to, um, and, and I, 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 that they're not fighting it. Uh, we're just needing to assess uh, you know, how many customers are on each month and, you know, work out the details. But uh, it's, it's very likely uh, because we want, we don't want customers to have that negative impact because you're exactly right. So our mission overall is we don't want people to opt out and the messaging needs to get accurate information to people and hopefully get them excited that this is a cool thing and, uh, and dissuade them from opting out. And Trepepe Smith has got the laboring oar here, but each of you on this committee knows your community probably better than Karen and Catherine do. So that's my suggestion. Let's talk about that. Are you comfortable, for, for example, uh, the Carlsbad members to take a look at what you think would be the best way to do a, an outreach in Carlsbad? Are there key homeowners groups? Sure. Or, or, uh, yes, Chair I'm sorry, Barbara, go ahead. Can we finish our presentation? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. No. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, key points for uh, their 
our uh, constituents to understand is that CEA is governed by a, a board of locally elected officials and that they have a group of expert consultants that are working behind the scenes and helping to uh, manage and administer the program. It's, it's not uh, funded with taxpayer money. The city's general funds are not at stake or on the hook. This is a program that's funded by the uh, customers who uh, are charged the per kilowatt hour charge. And, and it's not an additional cost to what's being paid to SDG&E. Uh, CEA is replacing SDG&E as the entity that's buying and, and uh, providing the actual electricity. Um, you may have heard talk of, well, uh, customers who are, who are community choice aggregation customers pay an extra fee. And uh, we touched on it at our last, um, at our last meeting. Um, but there's a, there's a charge, uh, an exit fee, that uh, sdg &E does charge uh, CCA customers when they leave their service. And the purpose of this charge is to reimburse sdg &E for uh, contracts that they've entered into uh, for electricity that they had assumed they would be serving those customers, they contracted for the energy, and now they have these contracts that they have to try and sell. If there's a loss, um, that loss should not be borne by the customers who are still with sdg &E. So that, that cost is passed on in the form of an exit fee or PCIA. So this is a, these are not uh, our rates. We haven't yet set our rates, but for illustrative purposes, I just wanted to show that there's a, a per kilowatt hour rate that's charged for the electrons for the electricity. So in this, in this particular case, we're saying it's 10 cents per kilowatt hour is what sdg &E would charge. Uh, in order to be comparable, we need to factor in what is the exit fee that sdg &E will charge our customers. Now, we don't, we, don't, we don't assess that fee and we don't collect it. It's a, it's a fee charged by sdg &E on the sdg &E bill that then goes to sdg &E. And then we, we take that amount, we, we, we back it out of the sdg &E's fees and we say, what's, what's left for us to work with in order to be at parity? And then we say, is that enough money to pay our bills? You know, we, we're, a, we're a brand new business. We don't have any money in the bank. Uh, so we have to set rates that cover our costs. And, and this is the typical um, cost comparison. And in, I would say every CCA in the state, if you're purely looking at the per kilowatt hour charge for electricity, the CCA is lower. Um, it's this added fee that then brings the overall costs to you know, be equal to the utility or higher or lower. You know, it, it just depends on, on what the overall cost is of the CCA to operate. So I wanna stop there um, just to give a chance to maybe, you know, have you ask a question. Well, actually, let me jump to the bill and then we can come back to this. Um, and then this is a, a handout that um, Tripepi Smith has put together that really helps uh, to provide information about what the power charge and difference adjustment is and to help understand it. And, and again, it's a, it's a charge that sdg &E assesses uh, in order to recoup any loss they're incurring on contracts that they are now liquidating on the, mar on the open market. Over time, those contracts are going to expire, right? So, you know, they, those contracts don't aren't in perpetuity. They're, you know, five-year, ten-year, twenty-year contracts, and over time, they expire and and they're they're gone. And the PCIA, the 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 amount of uh, of contracted energy is going to decline, and the PCIA will decline. And we're seeing that uh, when you look at like Marin Clean Energy in Northern California, who have now been up and running for 10 years, their PCIA has really dropped off because that suite of contracts are, is diminishing. So it, it, it does go away, um, but it's most impactful in the early years. So this is a handout that we have. Um, I'm not gonna read through every bullet point. You'll have it um, in your materials I've sent out. 
but this is a something that will be on our website. Th this is really, I think, one of those areas that are of concern to customers who are considering joining a CCA is, is this fee, um, this PCAA fee. So here's a here's a sample bill of, of how it looks when a customer joins a community choice aggregation program. And so on the summary page of the bill, uh, there will be a, a new line, a second line that reflects the CCA electric generation charges. So you're, you're going to see the electric delivery charge from SDG&E and then the CCA electric generation charge on the, on the bill. So those two are, are added together uh, to determine what is owed for the month. When you go to the a, a detail of current charges, electric service. First, you see the delivery side of the bill and the delivery side, nothing is different uh, for a CCA customer. So this, if you looked at your bill, you know how your electric delivery section of your bill looks today is gonna look the same as uh, after you join the CCA. What will be different are two things. One is here's that PCIA, which is assessed by SDG&E, not the CCA, but they also calculate what their electric generation cost would have been, and then they deduct it out. So, you know, customers think that, you know, that sometimes have the misinformation that they are paying twice. They're not. While sdg &E does calculate what that generation cost would have been, they credit it back out because they are the, the CCA is now providing that generation. And that's, that's very key. What's useful about that is it's very easy for a customer to compare what they would have paid as a, as a sdg and &E customer versus what they're paying the CCA. A new section of the bill will be the section that's related to the CCA, the new energy services provider. So the Clean Energy Alliance uh, will be listed as the, um, this says Salon Energy Alliance, it will be Clean Energy Alliance. Our charges will appear on there. And then the total due. The customers don't pay us directly. They pay, it, the money goes to sdg and &E in one payment and sdg and &E separates it out and sends the, the money to us. So in this case, uh, at Solana, in, in this example, uh, the Solana Energy Alliance charges were $51.72 as compared to $63.64 for the same amount of energy. But then you also need to take into account the $8.36 charged for PCIA. But it, but it does make it so that you can easily see what that what that cost comparison is on a monthly basis. Any questions about the the bill and how how the bill looks for a cut for a, a CCA customer? And I do want to say, uh, board member uh, committee member uh, Kraus, I'm glad that you could join us. Barbara, this is Paige. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm just curious. I think um, a customer looking at this bill, um, when you say they can compare the CCA bill to SDG&E's charges, can you go back to that other page that had, no, the, on the bill, there we go, um, where it says some, summer electricity generation, how are they supposed to know that's SDG&E's comparable charge? Is it, because it's on the SDG&E bill page of the bill. Okay. These are all SDG&E charges right here. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think at some point that needs to be really clear because I don't think most people would get that. <laughs> okay. Just, well, we'll certainly uh, do our best. We we do we will have on our website uh, this um, illustration along with explanations. Um, we're we're pretty limited in terms of what we can ask SDG&E to put on their bill. 
Um, their bill is a format that's approved by the California Public Utilities Commission. So we really have uh, not much flexibility. Um, okay. But uh, it, that's a good point. And when we put the illustration on the website, we'll definitely call out that this is the SDG&E's charges. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. Thank and, you. Why, why does it just show time of use like current bills? Uh, it, the old bill before time of use went in. Yeah, it, it would look exactly the same uh, as it does today. So we'll we'll pull one of those samples, but the way it looks today, it, it does not change. Okay, I'm just used to seeing time of use and, and the, those really high summer peak rates. <laughs> Four to nines. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Anyone else have questions about the billing format? If not, Barbara, are we ready to? Okay. So yes, yeah, so uh, perfect segue. Um, so currently we are, um, what we have uh, thoughts that we have planned is that uh, we would like to have uh, your input and insight into uh, who are the key stakeholder groups that we should engage um, I guess uh, Chair Warden is thinking about subcommittees. I would say let's be a little less formal and say, you know, each of the committee members within your communities, we can identify those key stakeholder groups that we want to engage and come up with a plan of engagement uh, working with the committee members from those um, cities. And then, uh, you know, we're not currently in an environment of uh, in person meetings, but Certainly, I think virtual meetings, uh, people are used to it and it seems to be effective and we can uh, set those up. We can develop additional printed materials. Uh, we've, we've kind of gone through and we have input on the, the bill sample, for example, for our, for our packet, we're gonna, I specifically, I call out that this is the SDG&E page, um, but interested to hear from you what other forms of engagement you think uh, might uh, work best for specific um, key stakeholder groups. Um, another key aspect is monitoring our social media. So our Tripepi Smith will be helping us with monitoring social media and responding to inaccurate information. Um, you know, to the extent that uh, we are not in violation of the Brown Act, and that's something we need to be very care you know careful of. We did hear from our general counsel at our last meeting that. Um, you know, as as uh, as committee members that are subject to the Brown Act, to you know, we are, we have to be careful that that we're not um, violating the Brown Act in our uh, communications on social media. Um, but certainly, you can help us by identifying information that uh, is starting to get out there, creep that's not accurate that we can address. Um, another. Uh, idea we have is to have a town hall style Q&A meeting that again would be virtual, but we would um, uh, open it up to the public and maybe have more than one where we uh, ask questions. I apologize for the killer dog. <laughs> uh, that, that we ask for uh, questions in advance if possible and uh, people can call in and ask questions as well and uh, have one-on-one -on -one dialogue and go through a, you know, a, a basic um, presentation, but really keep it free flowing and Q and A. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Chair Warden uh, to have Barbara, a discussion. Yep. But Barbara, before you, we discuss this, I, I had a quick question. The 100% um, option. Yes. Yeah. Clean impact, I think it's called. Is there an economic benefit to the CEA to do that, um, other than trying to convince people it's good, good environmentally? I'm, so yeah. I'm just. I'm, yeah, our, our rates, uh, when we set the rate for that, we will set it to just recover that additional cost. Okay. We don't add anything else in there. Uh, you know, our goal is to encourage people to make it as cost. Uh, it, it, the, keep the cost as low as possible to encourage as many people to opt up. And so there's there's no additional, other than the addition, incremental increase in cost, there's no other factor in oh. there. 
And, and on the website, there'll be some examples of how much more that would cost, right? There will, yes. Okay. Yeah, Barbara, um, question. Uh, what is your experience for other CCAs when they launch? Do the, do the majority of people just, you know, don't do anything so they automatically opt in? Let me, uh, let me stop sharing so I can see everyone's handsome faces here. There we go. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate the question. So I, I have uh, been uh, had experience in launching, I think, eight or nine CCAs. Um, customers are, are automatically enrolled unless they take an action to opt out. Um, I will say that a uh, it recently the the um, majority of them are doing the required mailers. And uh, maybe one or two uh, town hall type meetings, and then targeted uh, key groups. For example, uh, I know uh, one city met with their um, their business, their their chamber of commerce, their business um, groups at their regularly scheduled meetings. Um, the, in the early years, they were having um, in person special meetings in, at city council chambers. And those were very poorly attended. Um, so they, they didn't turn out to be effective, but the virtual town hall type meetings that um, I've had one recently, they're, they're uh, actually the size of that CCA is, is very similar to the size of Clean Energy Alliance. And they had over a hundred questions uh, posed to them from the community. So that was, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, from a city council perspective, when you have open you know, meetings on a single topic. Sometimes you don't have a great turnout. That to me was extremely successful to get, you know, a hundred different um, questions from the community and people participating. So those tend to be fairly effective. You want to you want it to be a good use of everyone's time. Thanks, Barbara. Let's. Deborah has her hand up. Let's go to Deborah, and then if anybody else who wants to chime in, put your hand up virtually or literally, and I'll try to call on you. So thanks for all the information, Barbara. One question I had is on the existing um, Solana Energy Alliance product, which is the 5075. And I noticed that the, the board is considering that. And um, I just wanted to get some more information, uh, some clarity on that. And also, you know, what is their timeline on the, um, the program for low income and the small business? It, I'm assuming that decision will be made next month. And then lastly, I just feel like uh, with us, with our city having an existing, I mean, I'm already um, you know, enrolled, I'm already getting energy this way. I think the tactic for our city has got to be very different than the tactic you're using broadly, um, unless people are not enrolled. If they are enrolled, I think we have to have a separate messaging. So I guess that'll come out in our small group. But you didn't mention that, but I just want to say, you know, and um, again, to Paige's point, that line on the bill is so confusing. I don't think we, you know, even really brilliant people are still struggling with that line and what it means. So I think anything we can do to, um, you know, put some, provide some clarity on that is really important. Yeah. So let me. Uh, Go ahead, Barbara. Thank you for your question. So. Our, currently our JPA agreement says that, S, that Clean Energy Alliance will have a default product from a source from a min minimum 50% renewable energy. So uh, in order for us to have a, a product that matches Solana Energy Alliances, which is 50% renewable, 75% carbon free, the board needs to actively take a, take a vote and uh, approve that offering. Um, and we need to quantify for them what the, there's a, an incremental cost uh, to that. Uh, it's not much cost, but there is an incremental cost. So the board will be uh, acting on that at the next meeting, um, at their February 18th meeting. They'll also be uh, uh, taking action on whether or not they plan to uh, offer the local, what had been termed the local impact product, which is the a lower renewable percentage, which would then have the offsetting credit related to that um, cost differential. Um, in terms of outreach to Solana Energy Alliance customers, um, 
I would I didn't do a good job at talking about it because you're right, they're very different. The Solana Energy Alliance customers have already had their four mailers uh, and their opportunity to opt out as part of when they were enrolled in Solana Energy Alliance in 2018. So they don't get that new window again. The rules, the rules and regulations don't allow that. Uh, we did send a uh, communication out in November. Uh, we were um, Solana Energy Alliance customers uh, have uh, are required to provide six months notice to SDG&E if they want to leave and go back to SDG&E. Um, if if they don't give six months notice, they can still do an immediate return, but they're put on uh, what's called transitional bundled service. So they're they're subject to the to SDG&E's you know, terms and conditions with regards to an immediate return. Uh, that was included in the communication that went out in November. We plan to do a subsequent communication that looks very similar to what we just saw, but again, reiterates that uh, you know, a, a communication went out in November and we're one month or so away from that transition of moving the CCA customers. I, I don't see any reason, although I, you know, of course, you know, we won't know what the board's going to do in terms of the 5075. You know, indications are from the meetings that there's support, uh, that, that there's support for keeping Sona Energy Alliance where they are and not having them, you know, have an energy mix that's not as clean as what they've been getting, right? That they don't. So yeah, there's there's been, I think, uh, across the, the board members, uh, an acknowledgement that they don't want to see that happen, but they need to take that formal that formal action. Thanks, Barbara. Don, then Catherine, then Lee have their hands up. Hey, thank you. Uh, I think one important uh, selling point that we haven't mentioned is the announcement by SDG E that they're going to get out of the generation business. Now that we have a letter from their vice president from last year, I think it was in June, saying that uh, they're not going to re continue to uh, invest in, in energy generation. And so at some point, uh, the, the Clean Energy Alliance will be the only source of electricity. Uh, I think that's an important point, and it's a lot different than when Solana uh, Energy Authority launched, where SDG was actively competing in the energy generation business. But a, a second important point is there's already negative news uh, in Del Mar, uh, it's, some of it's been on next door posting, but it's uh, that CEA prices are gonna be much higher than SDG&E. And uh, this is being uh, promulgated by very politically active people in, uh, in Del Mar. Um, and uh, it may have influenced uh, one of our board members. So, um, the negative information is out there, and uh, it's, it's basically you're going to pay more if you go with the CEA, and I think that's a message we, uh, the most important message we need to be prepared to deal with. Um, yes, you're right. It's already happening. I mean, yeah. we're several months from launch, and the, and the negative stuff is starting. Thanks, yeah. Don. Barbara, did you want to respond to that at all at the moment? Yeah, He's hit the exact uh, key point with regards to what uh, most customers are concerned with is how much, how much, if any more, it's going to cost me. You know, we, we only have control of, you know, going back to that chart where we had the SDG&E's energy generation and the stacks, we can only control our rate. We have zero control or influence over that added PCIA, that exit fee. We don't, uh, we actively participate at the PUC um, with regards to ensuring that the, the, the fee when it's adopted is uh, appropriately follows the methodologies that have been prescribed for developing that fee, that, uh, that the assumptions underlying that result in the fee are based on accurate assumptions. Um, we've had very good success with this current uh, current rate proceeding uh, in that regard, in that we discovered that uh, SDG&E's calculation methodology was flawed and that it didn't account. It was, it was, taking, it was saying that they were gonna have sales based on all, no customers leaving, but that there was going to be 
which is not the case because Salon Clean Energy Alliance is, you know, those customers are launching in May and San Diego Community Power has a segment of their uh, customers launching in 2021. And we were successful at the PUC in getting the PUC to direct sdg &E to adjust their calculation to take into account uh, that load that was leaving, that, that, that they were not gonna receive revenue from those customers once the CCAs formed. And that resulted in the, calcula the rate calculations um, being more apples to apples comparison. So uh, one thing that I have, uh, that I'm working on with our um, data manager, which is Calpine Energy Solutions, is to have an online rate comparison tool that someone could go in and could uh, use one of their bills and say, what would I have paid if I were a Clean Energy Alliance customer? That is, is significant in addressing, you know, that, uh, that bad information. And, and until we set our rates, you know, we, we don't know how we're going to compare to SDG until we've adopted our rates, but we also don't have clarity on sdg &E's rates. I think they're they had one portion of their rate change effect of February 1st, where their rates I think went up a little bit. And there will be another rate change March 1st, which increases their rates even more, but we don't know yet specifically what per, per customer class, what that per kilowatt hour rate is. And until we have that, we can't do an, a real comparison um, to our, our rates. And the board is scheduled to uh, adopt the rates here coming up at the next uh, the next board meeting. That's important to know. Thank you, Catherine. You've been very patient. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate the recognition. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank you, Chair Warden, um, for your reminder that really outreach is our focus of what we would like to do today. And I think that the Clean Energy Alliance has a unique challenge. Many organizations that are marketing or encouraging people to participate are trying to trigger some kind of positive behavior. But as you said, really our case in this situation is to avoid a negative behavior. We want to do what we can to provide uh, accurate, informative messages that really encourage people to remain as part of uh, the Clean Energy Alliance and to participate in the CCA instead of choosing to opt out. Uh, we have been in close contact with the board, uh, including members from all of your communities to talk about what is really unique about the Clean Energy Alliance and the, the, and the communities that are participating in the group. And what we learned is that everyone recognizes there are lots of benefits to clean energy. There are lots of benefits to a CCA, but the things that really came out uh, that we heard when we were talking with them and uh, surveying them was that there's a lot of value in this group having uh, local control and being rooted uh, in local control and having the communities represented by elected officials from each of the member groups. Uh, having board meetings open to the public really reinforces that message and encourages community engagement and dialogue. So we're grateful to have you here and to have your insight. I think that the example that we heard about negative comments on next door is exactly the way that we would really like to work with your group to make sure that everyone in your cities understands what the Clean Energy Alliance is doing. We are able to monitor each city's social media channels. We're able to monitor the Clean Energy Alliance's social media channels, but there are really some neighborhood groups and maybe it's next door, maybe it's the local Rotary Club, but if you hear someone who is saying something that is not true or is doing something to undermine 
uh, community confidence in CEA, it's just really important um, to make sure that you feel comfortable reaching out to us and to Barb so that we can pivot and make sure that we're providing uh, good persuasive information. Really, the more people who choose to participate, uh, the better the benefit for the communities, the uh, more assets that you would have to implement green in initiatives and programming and uh, do good things for all of your citizens. Thank you, Catherine. And to the committee members, that's a kind of a message. One of the reasons we walk you through all this educational stuff is that each of you is an ambassador to your community and we want you to be informed and accurate in the information you have. Lee, you're up. Oh, yeah, just, uh... I guess by listening to everybody else, I've changed what I was going to say. So there, are, there is a Facebook uh, group in Del Mar that a lot of us, even Salon and Beach, are a part of. But you have to be invited to, to participate in that group. And they've already started putting out negative stuff about the CEA. So how do we handle that? Let's let uh, Trippepi or Barbara take a shot at that if you have thoughts. Sure, Lee, if you would uh, be able to share the name of that Facebook group with Barbara and with our team, then I think our first step would be to reach out to the city staff to see if there is someone from the city who is already monitoring or participating in that group. And then we would identify the concerns that they have, uh, come up with some responses, and then figure out a strategy to uh, politely and tactfully uh, correct any misinformation that would be shared within that group. All right, I, I will do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll send it to Barbara, but there's also council members that are involved. So are a part of the group, but you know, uh, I can share all that with Barbara. Sure. And I would reiterate as, uh, as Barb says, if, if there are council members who are discussing that type of business on that group, or even if the members of this group are, are having a discussion on social media, it is a violation of the Brown Act. Uh, so we would need to notify uh, council and have, have him intervene in that situation. Oh, all right, that's that's great. Uh, I guess back to my other question is Solana Beach is so different because we've been part of it for a while. So, so how do we get people to decide to re to opt in now? The people that have opted out because I've had you know I've had people that tell me, well, I didn't do it because it's more money. So, um, you know, so yeah. how do we do that? That's that's a great question, and I think that's a. That's a worthwhile discussion to have. And I think that um, let's schedule something uh, separate. Okay. Uh, because uh, while it's, you know, there's this requirement to give six month notice to go back to sdg &E, there's the same requirement to give six month notice to come to, to join us. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, let's talk about that because I think that's, um, that's a completely different communication and um, marketing is, you know, someone who's already made a conscious decision not to be a part and, you know, to encourage them to, to join. And do we know how many people in Solana Beach are part of, or how many households are part of it? Do we know that? Uh, there's, yeah, it, it's approximately 90% uh, of what we call eligible um, customers are in Salon Energy Alliance. So about 10% have opted out uh, over the course of the, you know, two and a half or so years. Um, okay. So okay. it'll be just about three, it's just about three years actually. Yeah, so, uh, so we know, we do have, uh, we do track that and have statistics on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys, all right, Deborah, you're up. Okay, just quickly, um, what what um, Lee was sharing sort of bothered me that we have council members that are in opposition. Is that something that's happening? I I had was not aware that that was happening. So I think that's something that has to be solved, or we have to get some feedback because that could potentially. That's a really important piece when you talk about community engagement when you have elected officials that are you know working against it. Um, 
And the other thing was, this is just a general question. Do we have a budget to work with? I mean, are, are we trying to target this in a certain dollar amount or are we just idea making, you know, and that would be carried out with whatever contract um, we have with our marketing? Yeah, we have a, a budget in our marketing, but you know the things that we're talking about uh, wouldn't incur a cost. Um, we're not um, creating new materials. We're working with the materials that we were already going to be creating. Um, there's really no cost to holding a town hall Q and A or, you know, getting on an agenda of a, you know, some community group uh, to speak to that group. Um, so I, I I don't see where you know, unless we're going to come up with something, you know, making a lot of buttons or pins or pencils or pens and, you know, those sorts of traditional marketing, because we're not out in person, um, you know, maybe one day when we're, when we can have a booth at an Earth Day, you know, event or something like that. But um, we have whatever, I have no doubt that whatever we come up with, we have the budget to, to do. Wow, there's a quote we'll remember. <laughs> Deborah, did you have something else? Uh, okay, no. uh, let me ask Barbara if you would comment briefly on the experience in cities or in CCAs that have had to come in with rates a bit above their utility provider and the impact on opt-outs, because my understanding is it's not as scary as you might think. Uh, thanks. Um, to be honest, uh, in the current rate environment that we're in today, uh, nearly every CCA in the state has uh, rates that are a bit higher than the utility, than they would be paying the utility. And that goes back to the exit fees. Um, we've been seeing, uh, experiencing uh, very, very high exit fees, again, all throughout the state. But when you look at it from a dollars and cents perspective, it's an at, in, it can be on average a uh, dollar fifty to two dollars more a month on the bill, um, but typically, typically the most CCAs are doing what we're doing, which is they're offering their customer they're they're in it for the environmental reasons. They're offering a higher renewable energy than the utility. And you know if the if you ask a customer, is it worth you know two and a half? Two dollars or so a month to be, you know, have fifty percent renewable energy or or higher. If it's a hundred hundred percent, would it be worth it? You know, you may they may say, well, you know that it, that is worth it. That you know, I do, I am in favor of that. So it, it all will, would go to the messaging. Um, CCAs that launched at parity that and then are now experiencing higher rates have not seen a jump in the opt outs. Um, it'll be our, it'll be our, uh, I guess, goal or, or our mission is to communicate uh, what the benef true benefits of Clean Energy Alliance are. Uh, you know, it's the, the, the councils did not join uh, while we have a goal and it's in our JPA document that we have a goal of achieving a 2% discount. That was really not... Um, the number one driving force. It was really um, achieving climate action plan goals. And you know, if the community supports you know, initiatives that achieve those goals and we can do it at competitive rates and um, you know, we're, we would, we were hoping to have you know, rate parity. I, I can, I'm, while I don't have specific rates yet, I, I can say, you know, that the likelihood of a 2% savings per month is highly unlikely, but that 2% really is $1.50 a month. I mean, it's, it's inconsequential in, you know, the big scheme of, is it, you know, is it changing somebody's budget? Is it, you know, something that really is a, is an economic decision? Um, it, it's, it sounds scarier than it is. And I think having those Average bill comparisons helps to tell that story. Um, it also helps to tell the story that actually, when you look at what CEA is charging for the electrons, it's significantly less than what SDG&E charges. Our customers are having to pay SDG&E this added fee, you know, to make a decision to 
support the local program. You know, it's, it's the cost of supporting the program. And again, I, I'm talking to it, you know, about, you know, the scenario where we cost more and I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that we are at parity. Um, but it's, it's, it's could very possibly be that we are a bit higher, but it would be in the realm of a couple of dollars a month on average. So thanks, Barbara. Uh, Paige, you're up and then uh, Don. Oh, okay, just quickly, I, I think it would be helpful for our group to have maybe a list of talking points so that we, when we talk to the public, we're all on the same page. Um, anyway, that's just a quick comment. And, and I don't know where we are in the discussion, but um, when I, I'm working closely with my local Sierra Club team, and when we were pushing for CCE in, in Carlsbad, uh, we had house parties. Um, we went to the city libraries to promote this and everything. Well, and, and so I, I think another avenue is to do the equivalent of house parties, you know, small neighborhood meetings online that we could use. So is that your hand up to, for us to work with, to reach out to Sierra Club and schedule those? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. Oh, yeah. thank Paige. you, Paige. Yeah. Don, you're up. Yeah, I just want to point out that when you look at your SDG&E bill, they have um, the, the, the transmission and delivery charges now account for 75% of the bill and they keep going up. So when you talk about how much your energy costs, the Electricity supply is a small fraction of that. So if even if you pay a dollar more a month, you know, your bill's going to go up more because of SDG and ETH actions than because of CEAs. And I think that's a really important point. You know, you're at the mercy of SDG and E, this big corporation that you have no control over, whereas you can control CEA and you know the cost the PCIA is going to go down eventually. So yeah. You're in a better place. Yep. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Al, right. you got your real hand up. Um, one point that came up when this was all being decided um, isn't just the getting of renewable energy um, or the difference, difference in price between SDG and E and the CEA. Over time and in the future, any profits that the CEA makes goes back to the cities. It doesn't go to the share price of SDG&E. And that is a revenue stream for cities at some point. And um, it's a quite uh, broad spectrum of projects you can do with those funds. So I think we need to point it out that this is... Um, this is a corporation that's owned by the citizens and the profits that at some point will probably come in, uh, go back to the city. Yep. <clears throat> Good point, Al. Um, and I, I, I let me go back to either Catherine or Karen, whoever wants to add, answer it. One of you mentioned surveying our communities. Do you have survey information? What things do resonate with people when they're deciding whether to opt out or not. Somebody mentioned local control. I presume that uh, lighting people's fire about what could be done with reserves once they're built can, can light their fire. But if you have any specific experience or feedback from survey data, that would be very interesting to know. So Catherine. Yes, Chair Warden, we do have that information. If you would like, we can provide either the, the raw data that we have or a summary that went into our brand statement. I think a summary would probably be good enough. I don't want to turn us into individual pollsters, but as we're approaching our communities to have, be armed with what do, do the survey data show resonates with people, we can focus on that. And then, of course, we have to do the defensive part to fight the bad information. But yeah, if you could share that. And let me ask uh, everybody on the committee and I'm twisting your arm a little bit. Is there anybody who wants to opt out or being willing to be contacted by Tripepi Smith or to work with Barbara between now and March 
to flesh out more things in your community. Um, uh, was it uh, Deborah volunteered to, or Paige, I've forgotten already, um, in Carlsbad, but I'm gonna volunteer all of us to continue doing that unless somebody opts out and then we'll impose our own departure fee on you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, seeing no one, let's, let's, and I think Barbara mentioned early on, maybe we don't need the formality of subcommittees. I think that's probably true. And we can just leave it that, uh, you know, you think about it, what you can do in your community, talk to your co-member from your community. And if you have questions or suggestions, get them to Barbara and to Pepe. Uh, Smith would be very helpful. And yeah, then and that's, we, a, we really, that's a two-way street. When, yeah. when something bad is going on in your community, let's have Trepepe Smith and Barbara let us know so we can step in and help. Yeah, Barbara. Uh, I was gonna say, and you know, specifically if there are, you know, groups that you say, you know, we really want to, you know, we want a special meeting with this group, like Paige, you know, uh, identified the Sierra Club and, you know, a, a house party. Let's, you know, let's either get on a, a standing agenda for a group that might have regular meetings that we can make sure we're on the agenda or uh, schedule a meeting one on one with 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 that group. Um, I think it'd be very important. Great suggestion. Everybody take that to heart. Think about it and let them know. Uh, Deborah, back to you. You know, I just wanted to point out, um, having gone through the four mailers and then, you know, just making a decision to not do anything, I guess, is what I did. Um, you know, I think one of the things that might be missing, it, the focus really needs to be on the why. And why are we doing this? You know, what is the bigger, broader, you know, purpose here? Because if we're just trying to convince people not to opt out, that's gonna be a lose-lose. Right. So I think we had um, members, you know, talk from, you know, multiple angles, but I think, you know, if we're gonna lead, just really have to focus on the positive, the impact that you can have as an individual sentence, the why. And when I look at the first mailer, it has one sentence like that. And then there's just so much detail. You know, if I'm a busy mom or I'm a busy, yeah. you know, uh, working as so, you know, I'm looking at it quickly and I'm putting it down unless it's really an area that I'm, you know, really interested in. And we have to build that interest in our community to be part of this, you know, change. Um, so I love I, that. You know, just encourage more of that. And maybe these worked then, but you're going to need a bigger, you yeah. know, and especially since we have an administration that's really taking this on, there might be more alignment there. Um, so work on that messaging. And that's the all, one thing I would just say, be focused on, I guess. So. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, you, I'm a, I guess, an, I, an, I don't want to say academic, but, you know, I approach this from, these are the rules, this is what we've got to do, and <laughs> what you just said has struck me um, quite, actually, that, you know, we need to have big, bold, you know, support, you know, clean energy in your community, and if we're a dollar more a month, a dollar a month, we're going to, we're going to bring cleaner energy to everyone in the community, and it would be great to have a a testimonial because we're we're all going to send a letter and I think you know the cart the postcard only has so much space and that one side we can't change but we can certainly tailor uh, at something that addresses just that and make our campaign around you know we're we're making a difference we're and and I think the fact that Salon Energy Alliance has three years history of providing cleaner energy uh, at being competitive with SDG, &E, that, that to me, I always, I always tell them they're the little engine that could, you know, they're the, the smallest CCA in the state and have achieved great things uh, by, by being, you know, out front, being the first in SDG &E territory, blazing the trail. So I, I think there, there's a great story to be told that, you know, can't be told in a six and a half by, you know, a postcard. Yeah, that's why I was asking about your budget. I had some ideas about little things, but I yeah. did want to comment before we let go because I did listen to, I'm sure many of you did, the uh, meeting of um, our city representatives when they were discussing the opt down 36%. And they were talking about not opting down, but the program that would allow an entry point for small businesses. And they really, 
I thought passionately discuss the impact that COVID has had on our community and how important it is that when this launches, that it launches in a, in, in a success. So we have many, many members that we can build on to move up in those energy rankings. And I think that, um, that, that where we are, we might barrier, you know, we already presented a barrier for some of our small business that have been really hurt during this and certainly, you know, we don't want to make this sound like if you are a low income family, you can't participate in the mission of our city. So I think there's some common ground there. I don't know how they're going to come out, but I just wanted to share that, um, you know, after listening to um, the, the Clean Energy Alliance City Council members, you know, discuss it as a possibility. Good points. Catherine, to you. Uh, I was just going to comment as we're wrapping up. Thank you, all of you who are here. Thank you for being here. Um, as Lee had commented that there are some Facebook groups um, within which negative comments are being made. Another important way that you all can contribute is identifying kind of which groups those Facebook communities are affected by. So if you notice someone who is making comments might be a member of the local Rotary Club, or if you know that they serve on the parent faculty association for a local school, then that will help us identify resources for outreach. So if we know that the Rotarians have a bit of a concern about some aspect of the new CCA, then we can make arrangements to reach out to them and to include them. We also have, a, I think, an excellent website so far that has a lot of information and I would encourage you to look there um, and to provide feedback if you think that any of the questions and answers in the, on that resource are not clear. Uh, and also to encourage people to participate in these meetings, encourage them to attend the Clean Energy Alliance board meetings. All, all of it is open to the public and transparency is really important. Um, so uh, we hope everyone really engages. Thank you, Catherine. We're gonna try to wrap up at 3.30, which is about eight minutes. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions to Barbara or Catherine and team. One is I got something in my email in basket. I don't know if the rest of you did. It said something like something exciting is coming, clean energy, and then it had Clean Energy Alliance and San Diego Community Power both. It was pretty simple and I thought pretty good. Is Did you guys do that? Where'd that come from? We did not do that, nor were we invited to be a part of that. Uh, so uh, it was a, advertising a workshop or a forum that was being held by, I don't know if it was the Center for Climate. Uh, I don't know which group it was. Um, we weren't asked to sit on a panel or even if it was okay that they use our name to, it, we're glad they did. And hopefully, you know, whatever they're planning is uh, successful. But uh, no, we were not, we didn't know about it until someone forwarded the email. Okay, well, they're lost if they didn't get the best. Now, the second question I want to ask you is to the team, is the outreach approach to the business and industrial community any different than what we do to the residential or is it basically the same? Catherine or whomever, Barbara? I, I can tell you that when we were uh, launching Solana Energy Alliance, we um, met with homeowners association groups, um, either if we were invited or if there was a group that we saw a lot of chatter from uh, on social media, we would reach out and ask if we could come and, you know, talk to them. Uh, some are open to that. Some just like to, you know, talk on online. Uh, and then they had, at that time, they went to the uh, parks during the, the movies at the park. I forget what it's called. And yeah you know, different events that where people were going to be anyway. And, and I think with the residents, you know, people don't need one more meeting to go to typically, but if you can catch them where they're going to be anyway, um, it works out perfectly. Our opportunities for that are pretty limited. Um, so I think, um, I think the thought of making sure we're communicating, uh, you know, the benefits and maybe we add a, an extra few mailers or some type of blast on our Facebook, you know, page and, 
you know, it, one thought we had uh, talked about was maybe doing a um, every day pose another question or, you know, talk about some small topic about what's the benefits of, you know, Clean Energy Alliance. And maybe we quantify what's, what's the difference between, you know, SDG &E at 40% renewable and us at 50% renewable. Can we quantify that in reduction in greenhouse gases? Somebody can. I know there's somebody out there who can tell us, you know, uh, you know, why, you know, why is it an automatic enrollment? Because there are a lot of people who just don't like being automatically put into something, you know, and uh, that's, that's not an option that we have. It's how the state structured this program. We, we don't have the ability to say, we're going to do it a different way, but at least making sure that the right information is out there. So maybe we come up with a, you know, a 10 question thing and every, every day or two, we put something out on Twitter or, or Facebook or something. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to think strategically about how do we hit people where they're at and right now where they are is on social, sitting on social media, reading whatever comes, comes their way. I think those are good thoughts, Barbara. Small bites that come at you uh, are more digestible than a big complicated message. Uh, Deborah. I think Paige was before I'm me. I'm sorry, you're yeah. correct. Paige, my apologies. Okay, uh, some quick questions. Can we go ahead and start promoting on social media? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, and I'm yeah. just curious what we're being tasked with between now and our next meeting. Well, we, we want to hear from you as to what groups we should be uh, targeting so that we can start scheduling meetings and uh, getting on, we know we don't wanna have all of our meetings all in a one or two week period. So the sooner we can start doing that outreach, even though we're still in advance of the noticing, people have questions, they know it's coming. Uh, so it doesn't hurt to get out there ahead of time. So helping us with that, uh, we'll put together a, your, you have this handout, um, this presentation should be in your inboxes. Um, if there are, you know, it was asked to give you a list of talking points. So we'll pull out some of the key things that were brought up today that you all um, touched on that are key to making sure we communicate. Um, we had a lot of really good ones that will give you those talking points, you know, and, and uh, in an easy to kind of have access to at your fingertips, I think would be good. Okay, and we should communicate through you, to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, let me just emphasize that, Barbara. You, if people have suggestions, sh they should go through you, not directly to Trepepi Smith. I presume, since you're. I'm a, I mean, it, I'm okay with you reaching out to Catherine or Karen directly. You should. Their emails are in the meeting invite, but uh, we'll also we'll follow up with an email with everyone's contacts. I have, I have no concerns about you reaching out directly to Catherine or Karen. Okay, thanks. All right, I think this will be our last comment, uh, Deborah. So, when will you have your media channels ready? Like your Twitter, I'm assuming you're going to do this a Twitter account, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn page. When, what's your timeline for launch on that? And sure, then I they're already comment. all up and running, Deborah. So, we can connect with those. And okay, that's wonderful. And then the last question I had is Are you, how, are we doing a, um, engagement with businesses where we are like the chambers of commerce to talk to businesses. I'd love it if, if we could get you guys to come and present at a group school district um, for our school districts that I mean, we're big, big users. We're, we're a big um, uh, customer and I would love it if, if we could, and I don't know when to think about that. So just putting that on your radar and we can connect outside of this. Yeah, if, so that's exactly what we're looking for. So if you can send us a contact person to get that scheduled. Um, and exactly, you know, in some cities, chambers of commerce are active. In other cities, they're, they're not very, they're, they're not a, uh, as, as effectual, I guess, um, you know, so, but there might be another group. So if you have a, you know, a group that you're active in that you think would be good for us to come and meet with and be on the agenda. That's what we'd love to, to, to hear from you and uh, get the contact information so we can get that set up and have you help us with that presentation, help be a part of that. Great, thanks, Barbara. Paige, your hand is still up. If you had to, another comment, that's okay. 
If not, thanks everybody. Uh, this has been uh, productive and uh, be ready to help. That's what I can and say. Our next meeting is in March. So we will be back in March and likely we'll have some follow-up from, um, from where, what, where, what we've done so far. Hopefully we will have had some meetings and had some interaction on our social media and can report back and hear how you think things are going, what you see. All right, thanks Barbara and thanks our friends from Trapepe Smith and of course the committee members and any lurkers who were sitting in, we're glad. Let's, get, let, let's get those electrons flowing. There, you, there go. you go. Thank you, thank you for your time. All right, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone, bye.